So the last video should have been at least a relative review for you. Now we're going to move into fiber types, which um, I'm under the impression that most of you guys haven't really learned or studied the specifics of fiber types. So what we're going to do is we're going to approach this as if you were completely new and we're going to walk through history and get an idea of how they originally understood fiber types and then the classifications that we currently use now. Right? The first thing was back probably in the, you know, at any point, you can, you can just start at any point in history, right? We were able to visually look at muscles and we're able to determine that muscles actually had a different color based on the muscle fiber type or based on the muscle uh, itself. And indeed, whether or not you've realized it, you've made this observation before as well. Whether it was Thanksgiving dinner and you went to get a piece of turkey and they asked if you wanted white meat or if you wanted dark meat. Whether or not you knew it, what you were doing is you were looking and classifying different types of muscle fibers, right, based on color. And that's exactly what happened. So in the early parts, we were able to look and see that some fibers were dark red, some were lighter, and some were an almost whitish pink color. Hence the dark meat in the red and the white meat, right. Ultimately, we became to look further and further and see that these different muscle fibers actually had completely different properties. So as we started to move into the 1800s, etc., etc., we started to do different experiments, a lot of these done with frogs in the early days, and they were able to show that if you actually caused these muscles to contract, some of them shortened really fast, and some of them had a much slower uh, contraction speed. So our next idea, the way that we started to classify muscles then, wasn't really based on color, but whether they were fast twitch or fast twitch. Fast contraction or slow contraction. And indeed, they actually started to make the link that the really red fibers actually had a much slower contraction speed, whereas the wider the fiber, the faster it was able to contract. Right? So we were kind of starting to then divide them into two general categories here. Our white fast twitch and our red slow twitch muscle fibers. As we then progressed in the 70s, we started to learn more and more about kind of uh, different techniques using immunochemistry and, and different ideas to actually look at some of the biochemical properties of these muscles. And we started to find out, oh look, like we, we now see kind of this in, in between fiber. So it's got some of the categories of a slow and some of the uh, characteristics of a fast and, and integrates both of them. And so ultimately we became to look at the metabolic properties in, two, in three different categories. So the first was slow oxidative. And what we mean by oxidative is they rely heavily on oxidative metabolism. We're going to spend a lot of time on metabolism in this course, but we'll just say here the idea of oxidative metabolism means that they use oxygen very efficiently and are able to generate a lot of ATP and energy from that. Then they looked on the opposite end and they found that some fiber types didn't use oxidative metabolism really very much at all. And indeed, they relied really heavily on the glycolytic pathway. This is the non-oxygen dependent, right? And then again, we had that in between. So we had one that worked, that, uh, worked fast, that had a fast twitch speed, but also utilized quite a bit of oxidative metabolism. And so they named it the fast oxidative glycolytic. Again, that in-between fiber. Ultimately, this fiber, if we looked at it just from a broad spectrum, was kind of the pink. So now we had a little bit of everything. So we had our slow oxidative fiber, lots of oxidative metabolism, which is very red in color. And as we were in this biochemical age, we discovered actually what that red color was coming from. And as you can see in the very top, this is coming from a molecule called myoglobin. You may be like, uh... Have I heard of that? Maybe I have. You've probably heard of its sister molecule, hemoglobin, which is our oxygen-carrying molecule in the blood, right? And of course, our blood is red, so muscle has its own specific version called myoglobin, right? And it, of course, too carries oxygen. So these highly oxidative uh, fibers that require a lot of oxygen to make energy were, of course, high in this myoglobin, which is red just like your blood. Right? So we've kind of gotten these nice three categories here, highly oxidative, kind of red, and we have ones that twitch fast or contract very fast, still pretty red, 
and therefore we named them fast oxidative glycolytic. And last but not least, our white fibers, which didn't use a lot of oxidative metabolism, use the other pathway, glycolysis, known as fast glycolytic. Right? And the other thing that we started to learn as we looked into these properties is that sometimes it just became easier to call them type 1 or type 2. But this quickly went out of favor. And indeed, what we've now done is kind of scratch the type 1 and our slow oxidative, fast oxidative glycolytic, and fast glycolytic now fit into these three specific fiber types. Type 1, type 2A, and type 2B or X. So I'll go through them. Type 1. Type 1, of course, as we want to write out the properties, are going to be our slow oxidative, so slow twitch, highly oxidative, and red in color muscle fiber type. Our next one is going to be our intermediate, so our type 1A fibers. These are going to be pinkish, relatively high on the oxidative, still require quite a bit of glycolysis as well, hence the fast oxidative glycolytic, and again, as the name implies, a fast on the twitch or contraction speed. And last but not least is the type 2B or X fibers. These are our widest fibers, rely heavily on glycolytic pathways, and are going to twitch really, really fast. I'll tell you this. So here you may see, why is it B slash X? Well, uh, this actually comes from animals and humans having slightly different fiber types. So indeed, I uh, have done most of my research actually in the animal world, so mostly mat, rat and mouse work. These animals actually have a fiber type that is known as type 2B. Right? If we look at the protein structures we can now do and look at the gene that encodes them, it's different. Humans, on the other hand, don't have the exact gene for B, but they have a gene that was named X. Right? So in general, we say animals have type 2B fibers, humans have type 2X fibers. I try to kind of eliminate confusion uh, by just calling them 2BX fibers and lumping them together. Okay? So I'll try to do my best to always use that, but anytime I say B, you can lump them and X together, or anytime I say X alone, again, the idea that these are fast glycolytic fibers that are white in nature. So again, we can also break down these fiber types in lots of different comparisons. The analogy that I would give is, you know, this is uh, the, the beginning of, of my terrible analogies for the rest of the semester, but ultimately, why do we need three fiber types? The idea is if someone said, I need you to write something, you would maybe go into uh, you know, your desk drawer and you would grab out a writing utensil. But of course, would that writing utensil be good whether it was, maybe it was a, an ink pen. So you went and you grab an ink pen. Well, that might be really effective for, let's say, if someone was asking for your signature. But what if they told you, no, we actually need you to do math problems. And so you would think, oh, math problems, I should maybe go grab a pencil. Right, so you would fill out the paperwork with a pencil. Or maybe you needed to label something and make it permanent and stick and large. And so maybe instead of a pen or a pencil, you would go grab a Sharpie. Right? These are all fundamentally the exact same instruments, right? The same properties, thin long tube that your fingers can hold with something at the end that makes ink um, or lead onto paper in order to write. However, they each have their three different functional properties depending on what we need them for. And indeed, our muscles have the exact same thing. There's times where we'll call heavily on our type 1 fibers, right? Those are going to be required for certain types of activities. And then other times we'll require heavily on our type 2B or X fibers. And then our intermediate guys can kind of go either way and work between there. Just like you could use maybe a pen for math problems, but maybe it's not always the best. So there's your first terrible analogy for the semester. But again, just building in the idea that these three uh, muscle fibers are going to give us a range in which we can work with. Right? And range of what? What do I mean by that? Well, they're going to each have separate properties, and we're going to work our way through these properties as we go. First, we're going to start in biochemical properties. Right? The idea is that the oxidative capacity is one of the key uh, in, uh, biochemical properties that we can look for. And when we say oxidative capacity, what do we mean? The more oxidative capacity you have, the greater capacity you have to produce ATP. Right? A lot more ATP. Right? Where do we produce ATP? You've likely heard of the organelle mitochondria. As you know, my favorite organelle. Uh, these are, of course, the powerhouse of the cell and so deemed 
be called that because they're where we produce ATP using aerobic metabolism. Right? So we have more mitochondria. We also have more capillaries. These are ensuring we get enough blood flow, providing oxygen, which is going to be required for our oxidative metabolism or aerobic metabolism. They also have more myoglobin, which as we talked about, improves delivery of oxygen from the blood vessel to the mitochondria itself. And therefore, a muscle fiber with a high aerobic capacity, something that has this oxidative capacity, is going to be fatigue resistant. And of course, as I've spelled out, if you have all of these, these are of course going to make up the biochemical properties of, of course, a type 1 muscle fiber. A type 2A is going to be much less of that. And then a type 2 BRX is going to rely much less on these, right? So when we talk about fatigue resistance, we can talk about it as a continuum. Type 1, fatigue resistance. 2A, uh, they are slightly resistant, but still fatigue. And then 2X, right, are actually fast fatigable is the term that you'll hear me use later on in this presentation, right? The other thing that we'll talk about biochemically is, is one of the original ways they separated it was looking at the myosin ATPase activity. So myosin ATPase, again, is found in uh, the globular head of myosin, and its role, just as it says in ATPase, is to break down ATP and use that uh, uh, to actually convert the ATP into energy itself. Again, ATP, the energy currency of the cell, so we use that in order to cause muscle contraction. The faster you're able to uh, degrade or break down ATP, the faster your muscle contraction will occur. So therefore, the, the speed of your muscle contraction or your twitch is ultimately going to depend on which form of myosin ATPase you have. If you contain a high ATPase activity, you'll break it down faster and have a really rapid speed of muscle contraction. And of course, again, I like to stick to the uh, more of a dichotomy, but we can think about this is going to be our high ATPase activity is going to be in our type uh, 2B or X muscle fibers. And if you have a lower capacity or lower speed of breakdown of ATPase, you actually will generate less uh, 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 time to kind of your fastest muscle twitch, and therefore we're of course talking about our slow twitch muscle. Right? So continuing in this idea of contractile properties, as we just pointed out, Right? We have our speed of contraction, but we also have the amount of force produced. Right? Force production is um, uh, going to be dependent on several things. One of the things that we'll say is that it's dependent on the size of the muscle, or the size of the muscle fiber. And indeed, if we think about muscle fibers, type 1 fibers are actually smaller in a cross-sectional area or a circle, or the diameter of those fibers are lower than type 2 fibers. They're our largest diameter. So it's not really fair, though, because the larger the muscle, the more actin and myosin we can put in it, and the more force we can, of course, generate. So it's not really fair to compare them in that such way. So another way we can compare them is what's known as specific tension or specific force. This is dividing it by the area or the diameter of the muscle fiber. And indeed, if we still look at that, muscle fiber uh, force production is still highest in type 2 fibers and lowest in type 1. So both type 2A and 2BX are greater than type 1 in maximal force production. If we look at speed of contraction, as we've already talked about, the maximal shortening velocity, otherwise known as Vmax, is determined by the rate at which we break down ATP uh, via the myosin ATPase. So as we talked about, type uh, uh, 2X, 2B or X fibers break down really fast. Therefore, we're able to contract much faster than our type 1 fibers. And last but not least, if we combine both of these properties, that is ultimately what's determined by maximal power output. Power output is essentially just force produced divided by the amount of time it takes to produce that force. And of course, in this case, uh, we can look at the figure in the next slide, but of course, in this case, if you produce a higher force and you produce it in a short amount of time, you're going to generate the most power. And that's exactly what we see. Right? So if we look, we have our slowest fiber type, our type 1 fiber, right, generates lower force, as we already talked about, and it's uh, uh, slower in twitch speed. That ultimately yields it a low power output. On the opposite end of the spectrum, in our red graph, we see our type 2B or our type 2X fibers. 
These generate a higher force and generate it in a very fast muscle twitch, therefore the highest power producing muscle fibers. I'll note that you don't actually have to know exactly you know, any number, so how fast does this happen, et cetera, et cetera. Just know the general concept. The type 1 fibers, lowest force, 2A, again, always going to be somewhere in the middle, and 2X, the highest force producing. So the next thing is, how do we actually look at muscle fiber types? Well, in humans, we do what's called a muscle biopsy. This is essentially where we take a relatively large needle, uh, stick it deep into the muscle, and extract a small piece of muscle. Right? We can then use this muscle to analyze using histochemical or biochemical techniques. Right? If you're curious, this doesn't hurt really at all. A lot of people get squeamish or shy or aren't really up for it, um, but in all said and done, there is a local anesthetic, so you inject something like lidocaine into the muscle, uh, and so the patient feels nothing. Indeed, I've had six of them done in both of my thighs, which is the most uh, common, common place, uh, and, and seen and done this no problems at all with function. However, as, as you can imagine, and, and we'll talk about this as it relates to exercise physiology, a lot of people who we would be really interested in studying a lot of these properties don't really want or think the idea of giving up a piece of muscle is a terrible idea, right? So elite athletes, extremely hard to convince them to let us have a muscle biopsy. Right? They just think, A, it's painful, B, if you're taking some of muscle, then I'm not going to be able to perform at an adequate level. And indeed, we do recommend that you kind of don't uh, you know, work out heavy for a day or two. And so they're just not interested, which is um, actually slightly unfortunate for us as exercise physiology. However, it is a great technique and tool, and we can still learn a lot. And they're done all, um, all over uh, the U.S. in order to be able to understand this, right? There, it isn't without its faults, though there are a couple negatives. So first is, if you're just going in and taking a small muscle sample, so uh, the sample you can see there uh, in between fingers, these are about 40, 50 milligrams. A lot of times you take that out of your quadriceps muscle, which is a huge muscle, right? And of course now we're trying to take this tiny piece and extrapolate into the whole muscle, and that may not be the case, right? The other is, it's performed on un only one muscle group. And as I've told you, right, we've already kind of had an idea that we have specific muscles for specific functions, right? So we have certain muscles, like in the turkey example, we have white meat and we have dark meat, right? And so we have those exact same uh, ideas in human muscle as well, where we have uh, different fiber types, and muscle specific. So if we need a really powerful muscle, that's going to contain a lot of type 2 fibers. If we need something that needs to be active and fatigue resistant, well, of course, that's going to be predominantly type 1. So anytime we just take one tiny uh, sample, we're going to, and then try to extrapolate to the whole body or whole muscle, may not always be the best case. So now that we have our muscle sample, how do we actually fiber type them to understand them? The easiest way that we do it now is what's known as immunohistochemical staining. And in this case, we have an antibody that binds to each unique myosin ATPase. And indeed, we can then look at them under a fluorescent microscope, and we can get pretty pictures just like this. This was actually generated from my lab when I was a postdoc at the University of Florida. So we worked there. This is actually, uh, you know, uh, I just stole a slide out of there when, uh, when we were working, took a picture, and, and added it to the slides. But in general, we can see the colors are cha changed depending on who's running it in their lab, so it's not as consistent. But you can see that we have three different colors essentially show up, right? A blue, green, and a black, right? So in this example, blue is, of course, our type 1 fibers, our green is our 2A, and our black fibers are our 2B or 2X fibers. Right? So that's one way we can do it, is actually look at them from a a chemical standpoint, or we can run them through a gel. This is uh, kind of a more common way, at least for human muscle fibers, because it takes a lot less tissue. Right? What is a gel electrophoresis? It's essentially a big game of Plinko. Right? So we put it through a, a jello-like structure. We use uh, electrical current to make things run through them. The bigger the protein, the more it bounces around in the game of Plinko. The smaller the protein, the faster it's able to wiggle itself through the gel, and we can ultimately separate them by size. Right? So this, again, allows us to uh, 
sort them by size, and then identify myosin isoforms specific to different fiber types. And on the far end of this figure, closest to me here, what you can of course see is we can see three distinct bands. Highlighting, of course, type 1 on the bottom, type 2X, and type 2A on top, just based on size. One other thing that I'll note uh, in this figure, and it shows it really uh, closely, is that as you get farther away from me in this picture and farther to the other end, we start to see that we aren't lumped into these three fiber types. Right? We start to see these intermediate or fiber types that kind of have weird uh, uh, patterns. We're going to talk more about this uh, in later sections, but the idea is that for simplicity's sake, we continue to lump them into three categories. However, it's not always like that. There are kind of a continuum of fibers, and as you can see, we have intermediate fibers here. Right? So again, to review fiber types, we have our, fat, our type 2B or X fibers. They're fast twitch, rely heavily on glycolytic fibers. Our type 2A fibers, these intermediate have uh, both oxidative and glycolytic, and then last but not least, our slow twitch muscle fibers, which are our oxidative, right? And again, as I mentioned, there is this continuum between the three. So we like to simplify it, and it's great, and we'll continue to use that to kind of spell out this process. However, uh, when we start to work, we'll note that exercise actually will affect this uh, kind of, uh, you know, properties of, of sharing properties of, of different muscle fibers. Right? So again, as we compare, again, just to review, peak tension, this is essentially how fast they twitch, right? Our fast twitch, much faster, slow twitch, much slower. So as you can see in the figure here out of your book, our fast twitch reaches its peak tension much faster than slow twitch, right? And again, this is going to, of course, um, also depend on, uh, or if you actually look as well as the force, right? Our fast twitch muscle fibers generate much more force than our slow twitch. And again, the idea is how do we do that? Two reasons. One is our ATPase activity. The other thing that I'll point out is there's a lot more highly developed uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, which allows us to release calcium much faster. Therefore, we're able to not only have break down ATP faster, but we can get calcium out of our sarcoplasmic reticulum much faster as well. Something that I'm going to gloss over here is motor units. When you're studying for your exam on this, we're going to have already covered motor units. Uh, but type 1, smaller neuron, lower number of fibers, whereas type 2, much larger. That'll be an entire focus of one video. Right? If we look at power, as we talked about, uh, type 2B or X, greater than A, greater than type 1. Right? Again, as a function of all of these. Uh, we'll also talk about this in response to exercise, because as I talked about, the idea and benefits of having these three different fiber types is that they can give us varying portions, uh, various contributions to exercise. Right? As we talked about our type 1 fibers, we gave them the uh, analysis that they are fatigue resistant. And of course, this should automatically ring a bell that it goes, well, that would be really good if you were to go on a long run per se, right? So indeed, these have high aerobic endurance and are great at maintaining exercise for a prolonged period of time because they can generate so much ATP from oxidative metabolism, right? As you know, right, this is usually lower intensity, right? Most people don't go out sprinting for long durations uh, and are able to do that. They produce ATP greatly from fat and carbohydrate, especially from fat. And indeed, if you look at an endurance person, these people are incredibly great, or have an incredibly high number of type 1 muscle fibers, right? The question is, did they train them that way, or were they born? This, again, will become a topic later on as we get into exercise adaptations. The other end of the pool is our type 2 fibers. These aren't great for endurance, fatigue really quickly, don't produce a lot of ATP, but are super powerful, right? More force, contract very fast, are great at, you know, high explosive activities, especially our 2X, right? We don't use these a lot for everyday activities. You'll hear me kind of stress and talk about when's the last time you did an extremely explosive movement in your activity of daily living. 
not including exercise, right? right? We don't do a lot of those. We don't do a lot of quick, fast. You, you look really silly as I do now, right? So we, we don't really do a lot. So these fiber types don't get used a whole lot, but when they do, they provide a lot of energy. And then, of course, our middle of the road guys. More fat, more force, kind of fatigue resistant, but not fully fatigue resistant. So they're, they're our middle of the road, short, high, uh, uh, short duration, higher intensity events. Um, I have the, the one mile run here that for a lot of people that, that's more of a, a long duration thing. So maybe the 400 is a, is a better example. Right? And again, if we think about this in terms of performance, right, just I, as I mentioned, a long dur distance runner is going to have more type one fibers and that's accurately depicted here in this picture, right? Farthest away from me is our, is our long distance runner who's got a ton of red muscle fibers. You'll note they still have plenty, or they still have quite a few of the wider fibers or type two fibers, but on the most part, our majority of them are type one fibers. On the polar opposite closest to me is our sprinter. Lots of those white fibers, high force, high power, and then our middle guy right in the middle. Right. So what I've done is included a couple of uh, reviews. This is for you guys. I'm not going to work my way through these again. We've talked about each of these properties, but you can go through and look at these slides in particular. Right? This is great for studying, understanding the differences between these three muscle fiber types. Uh, in the next video, what I want you to do now is go watch a short video from uh, a really esteemed researcher in the area of muscle physiology, in particular in fiber types. He's got some really interesting data on an elite athlete, which I told you those samples don't come along very often. So listen to what he says and compare to what makes elite athletes such great in these strength and power um, exercises.